Welcome to Copy Traders Club, where you can learn how to make more money copy trading. I'm Gavin McCauley, my name and username on eToro. You can continue the conversation on Discord and Facebook. If you like this podcast and want to see it continue, you can do your part by recommending it to just one person or a group of people this week. Today we chat with a very unique voice among eToro popular investors all the way from the centre of world finance that is a beach in Mauritius. Here we go. Episode 34 of Copy Traders Club and we are being visited today by none other than the PI Ishfaq Pirali. We both seek your forgiveness, dear listener, that the audio is not quite as clean as we would like it. Must be something to do with the clubhouse's Wi-Fi. So Ishfaq is swapping his usual laid-back attire for clothes more suited to the austere and formal surroundings of the Copy Traders Clubhouse. And here he comes. Ishfaq, hello, bienvenue dans Copy Traders Club. Merci, bienvenue à où? That's a lovely little bit of Mauritian Creole. It's wonderful to have you here, Ishfaq. Thank you. I don't know how many episodes you've listened to, but in order to get past reception, you have to answer a series of quickfire questions. Sure. You ready for those? Yes, I'm ready. Anwale. Username on eToro. Ishfaq Bihali. Date you joined eToro. 16th of March, 2016. Year of birth? 1994. Place of residence? Mauritius. Profession? Full-time investor. Briefly state what you aim to achieve on eToro. Well, right now I'm an elite popular investor, so I intend, I want to be an elite pro popular investor by the end of next year. Name one of your investing heroes. Warren Buffett. Name one of your favorite investing books. Security analysis. That completes the formalities. Let's proceed into our VIP section here at the magnificent Copy Traders Clubhouse, the splendid Copy Traders Lounge. Ishfaq Pirali, are you ready for this magical transition? Yes, I am. So, Ishfaq, here we are now in the Copy Traders Lounge. It's a far cry from your island home in Mauritius. Let's talk about Mauritius a little bit. It's an island nation in the Indian Ocean to the east of Madagascar. Yes. Are you in the capital, Port Louis? No, I'm not in the capital. I'm uh, about uh, 20 kilometers south of the capital. In like a quiet town? Yes, I, I live in a small uh, town of 5,000 inhabitants. It's uh, near the coast, on the west coast. Okay, Mauritius fun facts. It's the only country in Africa where Hinduism is the most practiced religion. Yes. According to the World Bank, the country is classified as a high-income economy. Yes. The government provides free universal health care, free education up through the tertiary level and free public transportation for students, senior citizens, and the disabled. Yes. The island was the only known home of the dodo. And it's a tropical island paradise. Beautiful beaches fringed with coconut trees and inviting clear blue water. Yes. Is that the home that you'd recognize? Yes, of course, it's my home. So I was wondering, when you go for walks along the beach... Do you do so to consider your investing practice and you're a lone wolf strolling among the coconut trees thinking about free cash flow? Is that pretty much the size of it? I don't actually go for that intention. It's just uh, I'm going every morning for a walk. It's about one hour, 30 minutes, and uh, I'm always listening to an audio book. But sometimes the ideas come when I'm walking. But it's not I don't go for that intention, but they come when I'm walking. 
And it's fair to say you're like an old school value investor. Yes. Contrarian type. I wonder how much does it help your contrarianism to be so geographically isolated and remote? Do you have people to talk to about investing or are you very much a man who is an island? I do have people around to talk about investing. Not that many, actually. Most of the people I talk to are international so on the internet. But uh, I will agree with you that uh, being a, a value investor, a contrarian investor, I think sometimes it makes sense to be far away from all the noise of Wall Street, like Warren Buffett likes to say. He likes staying in Omaha, Nebraska. For that reason, I think it works well for value investors. Yeah, some of Buffett's disciples have followed his lead in removing themselves from centers of finance, haven't they? Yes. And they live in places where they can breathe a bit and not be under the influence of others. Although Mauritius is quite an extreme example of that. <laughs> Give us an idea of your morning walk. Paint a picture for the listener. So normally it uh, depends at what time the sun will rise. In summer we'll go out maybe at uh, 5.15, 5.30. And right now here it's winter, so I'm going out at, at uh, around 6, 6.15. So it's a one hour, 30 minutes walk. I just, I live about 200 meters from the beach. So I go directly to the beach, a walk. It's the, actually the longest beach in Mauritius. So I can walk for about 10 kilometers. I mean, five kilometers to go and five kilometers back. Yeah, that's my morning walk. And it's mostly along the beach. Are you barefoot? No, I'm wearing uh, sandals. But sometimes I go, I walk uh, in the water and then I'm going to remove my sandals, of course. And is it coconut trees and fishing boats and little crabs scurrying around? Yes, of course, crabs, sometimes even fish you will see in the sea, birds. Fantastic. If only we all could have such a lovely morning stroll. Must be good to <laughs> clear the head. Yes. So how did I come across you? Well, December 2020 was my first full month on eToro. Yes. So obviously the whole GameStop saga started happening kind of around then or shortly thereafter. And your name is usually the first mentioned when it comes to GameStop. I also watched a Felix Falix video of you, which was pretty much timed just before all of that happened. You're a huge rise in returns and in profile came shortly thereafter. To what extent did the whole GameStop saga make your name, do you think, on eToro? I think uh, right in the beginning of the year in January, it contributed to much of my, um, me becoming an elite popular investor today, because before that, uh, I was a champion popular investor. So it contributed a lot. But uh, right now, that news, it's, uh, it's already old news because today investing, it's, uh, it's mostly something new is always happening. So sometimes people will ask me what happened in January while my returns were so big and then I'm going to talk about GameStop. It's already old news, I will say today. Sure. Well, we're not going to talk about it much today. Yes. I appreciate that, but only in the context of the course of your year, say, and some of the things that you have encountered on eToro back then and also now. And we'll come to that later. Yeah, I don't want to focus too much on GameStop. Yeah, sure. Let's look forward. Let's talk about speed cubing instead. Sure. Tell us about your skills with a Rubik's Cube. So I can solve my recording 16 seconds, the minimum time, but normally on average, I'm going to solve in maybe 25 seconds. 25 seconds, wow. Yes. Have you seen the documentary on Netflix about the young cubers all over the world? No, I didn't. There's a fascinating documentary about it and how quickly they can do it. Do you happen to have a cube nearby? You could idly twist and then at the end of the show, we can have a demonstration? Yeah, I have to bring it. It's not, it's not in this room. Okay, why don't you go grab it now? Okay. <laughs> Speed cubing on a podcast, I imagine, is a first. So 
So can you show me the cube? Yes, give me one minute. Okay, so it's completed. I can see a red side, a white side, a blue side. Yeah. Okay. And you're not looking at it, so it no, should I'm be random. Looking. Okay. <laughs> Is that all mixed up? That's pretty yes. mixed up. Give it another 10 seconds of twisting. Okay, I'm just pop that to the side and we'll come back to it at the end. Okay. <laughs> it's gonna be funny for the listener to hear someone speed cubing, <laughs> not see it. Do you wanna tell us about your cubing? Is there any interesting stories about that? Did you go to any competitions? Not really. I mean, let go. It's just something you do. You did yourself. Yeah, it's just for fun. Actually, it was. Uh, I was still a teenager. A friend brought a cube to school, and he knew how to solve it, so he taught me. I remember the first time I solved it was in seven minutes, and uh, gradually I became better and better. And what do you think that says about how your brain works? For me, I will say that uh, it helps me relax sometimes. And it's not just the Rubik's Cube. I like all sorts of games, all sorts of puzzles, even sometimes I play chess online or other games. But the ship I like to play. So so you think you you have a tactical brain? Would that be a way of putting it? Yes, because if I will just use the example of the Rubik's Cube, it's like uh, you have to think ahead. Because when you are solving, when uh, let's say I'm I'm solving something, I'm doing something with a cube. I'm not thinking about what I'm doing. I'm already thinking a few steps ahead what I will do next. So that uh, what my hand is doing, my brain is already a few steps ahead. So and then I'm I'm solving it with my hand. That's that's the secret of the cube. You have to think ahead. Okay. And do you have a bunch of different sized cubes in the house? Things like that. Yes, I have the a two by two and the four by four and the three by three. Brilliant. I've never been able to do a Rubik's Cube. You could let me do it for days on end and I would never solve it. It's not complicated if you if you learn the, the basics, how how it works. Yeah, well no one ever showed me. Do you have to be shown? Do you have to be taught? No, you just uh there I know people who, who learned it by themselves, but uh it's better, I think, if, if you know the basics, someone will just explain to you the basics of how the cube works. So I will tell you the secret is that the, the center pieces, they never go. That's the secret. So they can rotate on each, on, on each other, but they are not going to move around the center pieces. So, for example, the green piece center, it, 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 it is always opposite to the blue one. This is never going to change. Okay, you're giving away all the secrets of cubing here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I think if I haven't done it by this stage of the game, I'm unlikely to ever solve a Rubik's Cube. But let's move on to the question from the Art of People. Can you give me a number between 1 and 10? Number 9. Who has been the most important influence on you? So if um, I want to talk about investing, then I think it's going to be Warren Buffett. Because... Uh, when I started investing itself, I was not really sure what I wanted to do. I was day trading. And then when I read about what Warren Buffett did, it looked so simple to be able to not aim to have 50% returns every week, but just uh, long-term constant returns over the years. He got 19%. So even 15%, it, it, it com you let it compound, it makes a big fortune over decades. So as an investor, this is my greatest influence, I would say. And what about as a person in life? As a person in life? I had uh, many great influ influences, for example, my teachers, friends. I would say that Warren Buffett influenced me as a person too, because he's a great man. He, he's not just accumulating wealth for himself. He, he lives a very... He's a humble man, lives a frugal lifestyle, and he's giving all away. So something I aspire to do. A 
this point in the conversation, Ishfaq, I often ask for the PI to read their bio. Can you read your bio down to the point where you start talking about annual returns? Because we'll discuss those later. Yes, I'm a long-term fundamental value popular investor approved by Itoro. I use fundamental analysis to find ignored stocks that are trading at bargain prices, then invest in these companies for the long term. I believe in having a globally diversified portfolio, which will beat the market. I have a degree in theoretical physics and is now a full-time investor running a fast-growing YouTube channel about investing and an investment research partnership with six years of investing experience. The minimum copy amount is $500, and I recommend to copy open trades. And since I am a long-term investor, the best results will come only after a few years. Okay, thank you for that. You repeat the expressions long-term a few times there, and you make it very clear the best results will only come after a few years. Is this something that you find yourself constantly repeating to copiers and would-be copiers? Yes, especially in the last few months because my portfolio has been down a little and uh, there are many new copiers that uh, joined from January, February because of my returns on GameStop and I had to repeat that uh, this would not happen every month, 150% in a month. It's over the long term. This is a long term gain. Your monthly bar chart looks a lot like one of my PIs. The very first guy I interviewed, in fact, on Copy Traders Club, Samosa King, he was also in GameStop, and his January column is a skyscraper compared to the little single-story buildings of February, March, April, May, June, some of which are in the red, so it's been very flat since then. And he, of course, is dealing with a lot of the same issues that you are. A lot of people questioning whether he's he got lucky back then and his his project isn't working and they've given him long enough and why is he not getting constant returns? So I see a lot of similarities that he's constantly battling with copier expectations and explaining that he's in the business of getting asymmetric returns, not in the business of green months yes that's the same as you right yes it's it's the same and i think um, i i know about his returns the issue that uh, i think maybe he also is facing is that uh, after those big profits now we have a lot of cash to to invest mm -hmm. and uh, many copiers would want you to use that cash to invest but you cannot just jump into any opportunity it's Better to wait for the good deals to be on the sidelines for a few months and to find these good opportunities. This is, uh, this is what I think as a value investor I should do. And as a value investor, you're very keen on limiting risk. And I saw a video of yours recently talking about the relationship between risk and volatility. So I want to ask you what you think about your eToro risk score. Is it fair and is it a metric that copiers ought to take at face value? If uh, the market is going up, then I think uh, it is fair because uh, then the risk is volatility. But like we, we had last year in February, March, April, when we had the, the recession, when the market was going down, for me, when I see those stocks going down, it was not that uh, they, they were riskier for me. But if we look at how Itoro calculates risk based on volatility, which is the standard in the industry, but value investors would disagree with this, or Warren Buffett will disagree with this, then uh, you see your risk score going up. But Itoro then uh, took uh, an, in an initiative to say that uh, even if a uh, someone has a risk of seven and uh, I think they have 90% of their portfolio in stocks, it's uh, not going to be an issue for them because they understood that these are stock investors. And Warren Buffett is forever going on about how risk and price are inextricably linked. If you get something cheap enough, the risk is yes. minimal. 
And I hear you preaching that. Yes, and uh, it's true because I, I have so many stocks that I invested, so many examples I can give. For example, Apple, I invested in Apple in 2016. It had a P ratio of, uh, I think, 10 at the time, and today it's above 30. So I'm not going to invest in Apple today, but at the time, the stock was going down. But I saw the value in the business. The business was about the same. Of course, it grew over these last five years, but it was still a stable business five years ago as it is today. So the value in the business was still here. Just the price was going up. So the risk was very limited when I invested in Apple. Let's have a look at your copier numbers and AUM. Yes. Copier numbers 1,058. Assets under management? It's 1.6 million. Okay, so if I could describe your copier chart. There was a very steep incline. And there's been a gradual decline from the peak. So at your highest level, you're now 1,058 copiers. At your highest level, you had how many? Maybe 1,500? 1,600. And then how do you feel about the disappearance of the copiers that have left the copy? I was expecting that it will happen. And uh, it happened before when I had a spike and then a decline. So I think it happens to many popular investors, actually. When copiers are going to copy you, they expect the same returns that you had. And it doesn't happen immediately. So you lose copiers. And yes, of course, now I'm working on it, how, how it can improve on it's about uh, communication on not just on eToro, on YouTube, on Discord. So I think it's co communication. You need to communicate with the copiers and uh, also in some way market yourself to new copiers. Yes, you're right. It's something that I see on so many copier graphs. Basically, if you're not currently on editor's choice, your copier yes. numbers are on, in slow decline. It seems. We, yes, we'll talk about communication in a second. Just before we do, can we have a little look at trades per week and average holding time? Yes. Trades per week, 6.5. Average holding time, 10.5 months. What do those statistics reveal? The trades per week for me, I think this is a little too high. 6.5. Because uh, it has been... Maybe three, four weeks, I did not open any trade at all. So it, it all depends. I don't know for how accurate this is. Maybe it's for the overall period. It also counts the times when I was investing more often. Or maybe it's over the last year. I don't know how this is calculated. And average holding time, yes, 10.5 months. But I think uh, for the stocks I have in my portfolio today, there are some of them I've been holding for five years. And... Uh, I made a few new investments this year. So, for example, uh, UNFI, I only recently started investing in this company. So, of course, it's going to be only a few months. And when you enter a position, you do so in a series of trades, right? You don't just buy one position. Yes, it's uh, gradually. This is uh, something that uh, I learned uh, over the years because before, this is a mistake I made. To invest uh, too much too to, to invest too much uh, too quickly, and now I've learned. For example, I want to invest in a company. I will say I will invest two percent over a three month period, or if more, then maybe it can take longer. Or if I think that I have to invest uh, fast, but uh, it's not immediately. Yeah. So the average trades can is a statistic that looks at all of the individual trades that you did, not just the positions you hold. So sometimes it can look inflated. Yes. Right? Yes, and uh, as I said but before, I was investing more often. I was trading before. So maybe all of this is taken into account. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about communication, as you brought up recently. You're an incredibly prolific YouTuber. You release a video once a week, more than that? No, three videos a week. Three videos a week? Goodness me. <laughs> That's a lot of work. And let me describe your videos to the listener. 
You're sitting in your house in Mauritius. There are twittering birds in the background. You're speaking energetically and sincerely in your kind of sing-song cadence. First question, what kind of birds are they? These are normal birds that uh, live uh, in all, all over the world. You have sparrows you have, and then there are other birds which are local birds in Mauritius. And I, I don't know. Are they nesting in the trees around your house? or? Yes, yes, they do. <laughs> they, they are, there are many trees around. And also because I feed them, that's why they are always coming. Today, actually, around this time, I'm, I'm feeding the birds. I did not feed them today because I know if they come, this podcast will be too noisy. <laughs> okay, so you said you're like 200 meters from the beach. So yes. it's not the sounds of the beach that we hear, really. That's a bit of a stroll. Yes, uh, at night, sometimes I will hear the sound, but when I'm recording, no, you will not, never hear. Okay, and you're sitting in front of your bookshelf, which showcases titles such as Security Analysis, Biographies on Einstein and Buffett, Last Man Standing about Jamie Dimon, The Ride of a Lifetime about Bob Iger, Big Debt Crises, Sapiens and Homo Deus, and 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, all by Yuval Noah Harari. <laughs> Tony Robbins and Berkshire Hathaway, some book on Berkshire Hathaway. Is that the compilation of shareholder letters? Yes. So what does that library tell us about the mind of Ishfaq? Yes, it's on purpose in some way I put this book because I have more books than this. And uh, for example, Security Analysis, the book I'm always referring to, that's why it's there. The book about Einstein, it's uh, one of the first books I bought myself it was many years ago when i just got my first credit card i think this is the first book i bought on amazon and it's in some way to remind me that i was a physicist i studied physics the book about uh, the tony robbins one this is i think the best book uh, for for savings for finance for beginners because there are interviews from great investors from uh, ray dalio in this book and uh, other investors. So he gives a good per perspective on finance, on how to save, how, how to invest. And then there is uh, the book by Ray Dalio, of course, Big Debt Crisis. I'm a great fan of Ray Dalio as well. The Letters of Warren Buffett. I'm a great fan of Warren Buffett. And then we have the two CEOs, my, maybe my two favorite CEOs, even though Bob Iger is no longer CEO of Disney. And uh, Jamie Dimon is still my favorite CEO today. Yes, and those three books by about sapiens and it's about the history of mankind. And as an investor, I believe it is important to know the history of, of mankind because you you learn a lot. Many things happened before, and they are happening in some way not uh, exactly the same, but uh, like Mark Twain said, history doesn't uh, always repeat itself, but it rhymes. So it's good to look at the, what happened in the past and to see, to, to try to know what, what the world will be in the future. Yeah, there are two books you, you missed, I think. There are two, two Russian books. So I, I lived five years in Russia. So these were two gifts I got from oh. two friends. So they, they are there. These, these are not the investing related books. They are fiction book, but uh, they are their Russian fiction. Well, it tells me you have a very hungry mind if you want to absorb all of this information from very various areas various intellectual pursuits you mentioned being a physicist have you read the book surely you're joking mr feynman yes i've read it that's f i just finished that myself i thought that was a great life story of his yes so that's the bookshelf behind you and then you sit facing the camera flanked by a couple of plush toys just to show your soft, cuddly side. <laughs> a teddy bear dressed like a vintage airplane pilot and some sort of dog wearing a visor, which I think is a memento from the World Cup in Russia. Yes. So uh, when I attended the World Cup, that was the mascot. So I bought that there. 
No, it's not really to show any side. It's just uh, to fill the space there. It was it was too empty in my opinion. <laughs> That's why I put this. Another question now about your YouTube videos, and this is something that I think many YouTubers find themselves having to do. But how many different faces have you pulled for your YouTube thumbnails? I have a, a big. Uh, maybe over, over 50 of them, these thumbnails. And I have done all of these only in a few days and I reuse them over and over. Because there are so many of them. There's shocked Ishfaq, exuberant Ishfaq, <laughs> confused Ishfaq, doubtful Ishfaq. I told you so, Ishfaq. Hmm, I wonder, Ishfaq. And my favorite, what are you going to do, Ishfaq? Damn YouTube and their need for pleasing their algorithm. I imagine yes. you must think sometimes. Yes. But I think also it's not really the algorithm. It's also how it attracts people because a thumbnail without a face and a thumbnail with a face, it makes a big difference. People are attracted by faces, by emotions. Even by your face. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> well, at least your haircut has improved from the early days. Yes, I can say that. What do you think when you look back at your early videos? Do you find yourself wincing a little bit, like I do already, about my early versions of this podcast? The first few episodes weren't quite right, you know, because it takes time to improve and settle into your stride. When you look back at your early videos, do you chuckle about them? Yes, and I. I sounded robotic in the beginning, and then uh, when I got uh, normal, I will say, but it was a little too, I was overexcited. I was screaming at the, at the camera, but uh, now it's better. I'm, I'm more relaxed. I'm not uh, scared. Even the editing, now, editing process now goes faster because uh, I don't make that many mistakes anymore like I used to do before. So yes, I will say I've improved. And in the beginning, I was making one video a day. And it, I will say it helped not really to grow the channel because people were not watching these videos. They were not that good quality, but it helped me. It helped me to, to become a better speaker. You started your YouTube channel not just for eToro. You were doing it as a self-promotional tool also because you were working as a high-ticket closer. Yes. Yes, I, I, it was not just for it or just for investing. It was about anything else. But later, I decided to focus on only one thing for the time being. Well, there's some tremendous acting in some of your early videos about being a high-ticket closer. There's one where you're on the phone, supposedly on the phone, talking to someone. And then you wrap up the phone call and turn to the camera and <laughs> speak directly to the camera. Would you mind if I linked to that in the show notes? For a bit of comedy value? Yes, it's for comedy because uh, I don't do this anymore. That's very good. Let's move from a lighthearted subject, as we were just talking about, to a subject that's a bit more serious. Felix Falix made a video called The Dark Side of the eToro News Feed, which featured you quite a lot. Yes. Where you got feedback that was less than risible. You got a lot of abuse yes. at the time of GameStop for selling out. Tell us about your emotions when you were receiving all that poison. In the beginning, I, I won't say just because of GameStop. Even before, I had uh, people with hate comments. Because when you're not just on Itoro, even on YouTube, it, it will always happen. So in the beginning, of course, uh, it used to affect me, but not anymore. And even this year with GameStop, I was not, I was not affected by it, not so much. Of course, I was happy that uh, Felix Alex made uh, that video. I, I watched it and uh, I like what he said, but uh, I wasn't that uh, affected because I've already got used to it after, after five years. Yeah, that's good to know. So from way back in the early days when you were making your first YouTube videos, you got used to people saying nasty things and it was water off a duck's back yes uh, it's it's now i've got used to it and most of the comments i get now are positive it's only during that period uh, 
with GameStop. I got some negative comments, but also that was the period where I was, I was getting new copy years. So the positive side far outweighed the negative. It's also an important skill to learn if you're going to be an investor with a public profile. You have to be able to take the rough with the smooth, I guess. Yes. I agree with you that uh, if you're an investor, to, especially today in uh, the social media world that we live, it's, it's important to, to, be, to be strong. To be strong when these comments come because you don't know about, uh, about these people. Maybe they had uh, a bad day and then they see something they don't agree with you. They are not bad people, I will say, but they are just, they are just going to write something bad. So you're not going to confront them on that. Well, that's absolutely the right attitude. Yes. You can't afford to take things personally. Yes. It says more about them that they're, that they're writing abuse than it does about you as the recipient. Yes. And there are people, sometimes you receive the same comments every day, every week. They are going to write negative comments. So these people, it's better to ignore them. But uh, most of them, I think they are not bad people, but uh, sometimes they don't agree with you and it's the internet. It's, uh, you don't really see the other person and it's easy just to write something. So it's better to ignore this. Dear listener, just a little pause here to say a few things directly to you. The calendar is full until the end of the year. That will mean 52 episodes, which seems like a good time to pause and call it season one and take stock. It's been a lot of fun and a lot of time and effort, but I'm pleased to be creating something of value for eToro users, particularly copy traders. Whether there will be a season two depends on a number of factors. I say it elsewhere, but I want to repeat it again here to really encourage a little action from you. If you want to see the podcast continue, you can help by bringing more listeners in. A lot of people still don't know about Copy Traders Club, so post about it on your PI's feed in eToro. Mention it on a Facebook group or in whatever Discord groups you're in. That's not too much of an ask, is it? On the podcast apps, there's always a share function that includes copy link. Use that. Or copy the YouTube channel link and share that. Or share a link to your favorite episode. There are many ways to eat an orange. I also have one of those affiliate links for new eToro signups in every episode's show notes. So if you know someone interested in signing up, please copy and send them that link and help support the show that way. Now, I know these calls to action that you hear on podcasts can easily be ignored, and I always ignore them myself. Let's be honest. But this time, I am asking you, as someone who listens to and enjoys this one-person independent podcast, to make a little effort to help it along. You can even press pause and take two minutes to do it right now. If you do, know that I am grateful. If you don't, every time you hear this bit, you will be overcome with a crippling sense of guilt and unworthiness. Until you do. Back to the show. Now then, let's have a bit more of a look at your portfolio. Let's give the asset overview. First of all, stocks, 69.5%, ETFs, 30.5%. So that's pretty clear. No crypto at all these days. We mentioned the Felix Falix video. I noted he was asking the question whether in 2017 and 2018, You were involved in crypto because the stats suggest that might have been the case. Was it? Yes, I had 5% of my portfolio in Bitcoin and Ethereum at some point in 2017. And uh, I sold everything 
just before the the crash. Okay, because you had a great 2017 and a poor 2018, which seems to follow the pattern for crypto holders. Were, were there other factors at play then? Yeah, there were other factors. 2017 was great, not just because of this. There was also Apple. I was heavily invested in Apple in 2016. So it recovered after the crash of 2016. But uh, the main reason why 2018 was not such a good year was because I held Apple and then 2018 also was a bad year for Apple. But uh, I did not lose that much because of crypto. I actually made profits on crypto. I bought Bitcoin, I think it was uh, $962 when I first bought and I sold at uh, $19,000. So it was a good profit. Were you using leverage back then? 2017, uh, no, 2016, I was still using leverage. I started in March 2016. By September 2016, I already said to myself that I will be now a value investor, not using leverage or anything. But then I saw Bitcoin, Ethereum, and I just said, I put 5%, let's see what happens. And we got that uh, bull market, that bubble, and I profited from that. So it was not intentional. But since then, you've not been involved in crypto at all? No, since then, no. I got, I got lucky once. I don't think uh, you can get lucky again on that. It's, it's now over. I'm, I'm now full-time value investor. Yeah, you're so deeply steeped in value investing theory. It seems to me that you, you can't, you wouldn't bring yourself to step outside of what you know and what you're comfortable with. Is that fair? Yes, uh, of course. Uh, when I started in 2016, I wasn't really so familiar with finance, with investing. I was learning. I was still uh, at university back then, so I had to, to learn mostly by myself on the internet, reading books. And uh, at the time when I first started, I thought I knew a lot, but eventually I understood that I don't know much. I have to learn more. And my circle of competence uh, became smaller and smaller. I thought I, I could invest in I could trade uh, oil, I could trade gold, but uh, eventually I understood you have to remain in your circle of competence. If uh, you made a great returns, maybe you got lucky and you cannot just hope that you will get lucky all the time. So it's better to focus on your circle of competence. And for me, that was uh, in stocks. Right. Well, you express some humility there and I see that a lot in your videos to this day. You're quite self-analytical and you're open to saying that maybe you did make a mistake here, maybe you're making a mistake there. You're not overly confident. You're not certain that you're always doing the right thing. Do you think that's an important feature for an investor? Yes, I will say I'm confident uh, as a value investor, but uh, whenever I'm making an investment, there is always a probability that uh, I'm wrong. So I will not uh, go into an investment saying that, 100% sure I'm going to make money on that. Of course, I'm looking for, if I have 95% confidence on it, then this is a good investment for me. But there is always the 5% probability that uh, it's a bad investment, I will lose money. So I'm always thinking in terms of probabilities. And I wonder how that humility plays out in the ears of the listener, the ears of the copier. Because in some ways, I love to hear humility and that an investor is aware of the downside and that they might be getting it wrong. But it's part of human nature that you want to put your money behind somebody who seems like they really know what they're doing and they're super confident and they're, you know, going to manage your money to the moon. Yes. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword, isn't it? You, you want to sound humble, but you don't want to put people off by being too humble and too full of doubt. I think the right copiers, they will understand. I, I don't think someone uh, would want to put money in someone who is uh, selling them a dream that cannot be achieved. They are saying they are going to make 50% every year. I don't think uh, you can really achieve that. So the right copiers, they, they would understand that uh, when I'm saying I make an investment, of course, there is the probability I'm wrong, I make a mistake. It's okay, I have so many other investments, but the other ones are going to work. This is uh, what I believe in. So you currently have 26 positions in your portfolio. 
That's towards the smaller end of the scale that I see on eToro when it comes to number of portfolio positions. What do you think when you see a portfolio of 125 positions? 26, that's a lot. I, I will explain to you what, what I mean. Actually, it's less. Only 15 out of these 26 are stocks. The other ones, they are mostly born ETS because I have, after my profit from GameStop, I wanted to invest in, in some cash, cash equivalents just to, just to look for better investment. So it, I'm more concentrated than that. It's 15 positions. And I can follow 15 companies, but 125 companies, it's going to be hard for me to follow all of these. There are people, maybe they can do it, I don't know, but I cannot do it. I, I prefer to focus. Well, necessarily, if you're putting in the same amount of effort, you're going to know more about a smaller number of companies. It stands to reason. Yes. And I don't like to make an investment uh, and then hope that it's going to go well or go wrong. I want to look for a very good deal before making an investment. It's a bad, if not okay deal, I'm not going to make it. The top five positions range from approximately 7.5% of your portfolio to 5.5%. And in the invested column, they are United Natural Foods, Discovery, Essent Group, Polymetal International, and Skyworks. One thing I want to talk about, Ishfaq, is that it's not the most synchronized portfolio I've ever seen. There are no enormous desyncs, but if the top positions in the investor column are one, two, three, four, five, in the value column, the top would be the equivalent of one, five, eleven, seven, three. So that's something to consider. The biggest offender there is a company which I love to hear you pronounce in your accent, which is Freeport McMoran. The invested amount is 3.93% and value 654 So that's a bit of a significant discrepancy. But my main point here is the extent to which the top five positions differ from you and from a would-be copier today. What do you say about that? Yes, I agree with uh, what you're saying. There is a discrepancy and uh, it cannot be 100% eliminated, especially if I'm investing in the long term. But sometimes I try to minimize it. I did that uh, in the beginning of the year, but uh, maybe I'm not going to do it every month. It's maybe next year I will do it again. And I understand this issue, but uh, for me, if you're thinking about the long term, someone is copying me, I don't think it matters that much. If we look at Freeport McMoran itself, it's so much the discrepancy because I invested a long time ago. And I don't want uh, a new copier who is investing today to put, uh, it, I think it's 7% now my portfolio on the value. So I, I don't want them to have 7% exposure. Maybe they can have less, only 3%, because most of the gains have already gone. So 3%, it's, uh, it's better for them at, at such a price. So that's why I'm not uh, so worried. Of course, the returns over the short term, it's not going to be the same. But if you're thinking about the long term, then uh, it's okay. Yeah, I don't imagine most copiers really look at that level of detail. Some do. I doubt many of the copiers that came to you after GameStop would stop to consider that particularly. Which reminds me, your GameStop position rose to be how much of your portfolio at its maximum? It uh, rose to 40% and that uh, had a rule that uh, no position should be more than 40% and that's when I started selling. And how long did it occupy such a huge position for? Only a few days. Maybe weeks, maybe top uh, one and a half weeks. So there was some criticism at the time, wasn't there, from a few people saying, how can this guy call himself a value investor when he's got so much in one stock? What would you say about that? So that number 40%, it comes from one of the earlier letters that Warren Buffett wrote when he was still uh, not CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, but uh, he's, uh, Buff the Buffett partnership. So in that letter, he said that uh, he can have maximum 40% of the portfolio in a company above that he's going to sell. And uh, GameStop at the time when 
it became 40%, it was $58 a share. And for me, that was still uh, undervalued because the price that I put was, I think, 65 So when it reached 65 then it was overvalued for me. The intrinsic value was 65 I mean. And uh, I started selling more. But then the short squeeze was also happening and I knew that it could go well beyond 65 So that's why I was still holding a little. But it would not affect my new copy years that much because uh, they would get only 8% exposure to it. And when, as I was selling the exposure, they would get would be lower. So it was only for the long-term copiers. They were the one making the most profits. And uh, that's what I explained when you asked me the question about discrepancy. For long-term copiers, it goes away. But for the new ones, maybe it can have this effect. But uh, also, I don't want the new copiers to have 40% of their portfolio in GameStop when it's $100, which for me is overvalued. Buffett says that the main things to understand from the intelligent investor come in chapters 8 and 20. Now, I've got a copy of that book, and most of it is in crisp, virginal condition, while chapters 8 and 20 are reasonably well-fingered. It is all about timing and pricing and the mood swings of Mr. Market, and 20 is all about the margin of safety. Not every PI talks about a margin of safety or seems to consider it fundamental to their approach. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of a margin of safety to you? As a contrarian investor, you're investing in something that is falling. So if let's say you see that the intrinsic value of the stock is $100 a share, and uh, the price is $90 a share, and it has been falling, you don't want to invest at $90 because it will keep falling and you don't know for how long. So you always take a margin of safety. It's very important, I believe. If you say 30%, then only when the price falls to $70, then you buy. And it's not just because of that. It's also because of your own uh, mistake that you made. The margin of safety protects yourself against mistakes that you made. Maybe you made the calculation, you got $100, but you missed something. So even if you made a mistake, you are going to be protected by the margin of safety. Do you have a specific margin of safety that you stick to? Are you a 50% man? It depends on the company. It depends on the analysis I made. If I'm investing in, uh, let's say, Chinese company, the margin of safety is going to be bigger because sometimes you cannot really trust these numbers. They are non -audit not audited, so you need to be more careful. Also because of volatility in China, so the margin of safety is always going to be bigger there. And tell us about your methods for calculating intrinsic value. I use the same method that uh, Warren Buffett has preached, that it's the discounted owner's earnings. It's not really the earnings we have on income statement. It's not re really the cash flow that we see on the cash flow statement, but it's something called owner's earnings. I'm not going to speak to you how to calculate it, but uh, the value of the company is all the owner's earnings that the company can produce over its lifetime, but because money today has more value than money in the future, you need to discount the future. Okay, now rather than me ask you a question, Ishvak, we're doing a new thing here where you kindly assisted me by putting out a link so that people could ask you a question on your from your Discord group. We've got a question here from Joe Seppi, who I believe is based in Bahrain. This is Joe's question. Ishvak. How do you think Tesla-owned Penguin Esports will affect Duyu's future? Thank you, Joel, for the question. It's a, an interesting question, I will say. But I'm not really worried about how Duyu's business is going to be affected by Tencent. I know that now the merger is not happening, that uh, Tencent will always be a bigger competitor. But this has always been taken care of by the margin of safety. And uh, today, to you, they have uh, a big portion of market share, bigger than compared to Tencent. And that's why I'm not worried about it. They have three main players in China, and all three of them, I believe, can, can compete. The big three being Do You, Huya, and now Tencent's Penguin Esports. They're going to share the market. 
Yes, Huya and Duyu, they are the market leaders. They have about the same uh, customer base. Tencent is a smaller player. And I believe that uh, it's not really going to affect uh, Duyu that much. All three companies can compete. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about China because it's you've been hurting recently because of it. But I think it sounds to me like you're still bullish long term, not just on Do You, but also on Chudian. Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Chudian is in the financial services industry in China. When you're assessing risk in China, do you not think maybe financial services is one of the higher risk areas to be involved in? Yes, it's a, it's it's true that uh, a business like Chudian is risky. And that's why they were doing things now that they cannot really do. That's why the revenues, the profits are going down. But looking at the balance sheet of the company, it is undervalued today after taking the margin of safety. And the fact that they were buying back shares, it shows that uh, they are financially strong. So that's why I invested in the company. In my last chat with Hugo Menenti, or Hugo Manonti, he was talking about China and he was saying that he, he will probably invest a little bit more into China, but he's going to stick to those companies that sort of have the government blessing, if you like, because the risk is so great with others. Anything to say about that? There's always going to be risk in China. It all depends on how much you're going to invest. I won't advise anyone to put uh, more than 10% of their portfolio in China. Of course, they, they can. It's up to them. But uh, for me, my strategy, more than 10%, I don't think it is a good idea. And uh, maybe I made a mistake here with to you because at some point it was 8% of my portfolio. And I could have taken the profits. I didn't. So it was a mistake I made. And today it's much less than that. And uh, to answer the question about uh, the companies which are protected in some way by the government. I have uh, China Mobile in my portfolio, which is 75% owned by the Chinese government. And uh, yes, I agree with uh, this, that it's good to invest in the companies that are protected, owned by the Chinese government. But this is not the only Chinese economy. In China, there are two types of economies. There is the entrepreneurial capitalist economy, where you have these smaller companies these booming companies, and then we have the the state capitalist economy where the government still has influence. And I believe it's important to have exposure to both of them. Presumably, GameStop has been your best investment. Would that be correct? Yes. Yes. And rivers of ink have been poured over GameStop, and I get the impression you don't really want to talk about it too much. Yes. Uh, or maybe you do. Do you want to give us just a quick, broad brush? Because I often ask people about their best and worst investments. We can spend more okay. time on the worst investment if you want. <laughs> okay, you can, you can ask me a few questions if you want on GameStop. Well, just to give us the, in a nutshell, why GameStop worked so well and why your thesis was solid and maybe the extent to which you got lucky? It worked so well because uh, the way that the market saw GameStop and uh, what the numbers said were totally different. If you're just going to look at uh, the income statement, you would think that GameStop is losing money, but in reality, their cash flow was positive. They were losing money because of impairment of goodwill. So they were generating enough cash flow, they were buying back shares, and I knew that we were going to see the next console cycle. Of course, they are going to generate more cash flow. I'm not saying that the uh, GameStop business were doing that great. No, the business, of course, it, over time it was going to fail, but uh, not as the market predicted. And of course, the company, the stock was heavily shorted. More than 100% of shares outstanding were shorted, and if the new console cycle came, Eventually, those short sellers themselves they would be forced to buy back their shares because they want to take, they have to take profits. So you buy back their shares. 
So that's why I said we are going to see a short squeeze. Of course, at the time, I did not know about Wall Street bets. They, in some way, I will say that uh, they precipitated the short squeeze, but it would have happened eventually. But not to the same extent that it did, right? It, it all depends because uh, we cannot know what would happen if uh, they were not there. But uh, I think it would have happened because uh, when the short sellers are buying, there are always going to be speculators who would enter. Only this time, the difference is that the speculators were unready. That's uh, what I see. Because in 2008, uh, we saw a bigger short squeeze with Volkswagen Group. And there were no Reddit at the time. Okay, at the time, the speculators came in different forms. And there have been short squeeze before that uh, with silver, I think, in the 1970s. And... Uh, there were no internet at the time. Of course, speculators uh, were in different forms. I sh- I'm sure you'd appreciate a silver short squeeze right now. I see your silver position is quite down. Not really. I'm not. Uh, I don't want a silver short squeeze. It's uh, it's a long term investment. I would not really investment. It's a long term hedge. I would say against uh, inflation. Okay. Well, let tell us also then about one of your worst investments. And what did you learn from it? My worst investment, uh, I made so many mistakes, but I will talk about by year. It was uh, in uh, 2016. I was new to investing. And the company, I think, had a PE ratio of four. What's the company name? It's Bayer, the German company. Bayer, okay. Yes. So for me, a PE ratio of four and the price to book value ratio was very low and it fit the profile of what uh, Benjamin Graham gives in the intelligent investor the seven points that a company should have and I invested in it just based on that but I missed many things they they bought uh, Monsanto just after that and they took a lot of debt to do that and uh, I missed many things the losses that were happening on the company so I thought that as a value investor you have to read what uh, Benjamin Graham, the rules, and if a company fits these rules, you just invest. But that's not the case. There are other factors to consider. And that was before you were a PI? Yes, that was before. And uh, But I held uh, Bayer for quite some time before selling it, uh, even after I became a popular investor. And that was another mistake that I waited too long, thinking it would recover, but it never recovered. But sometimes mistakes can be can be a good investment. GameStop at some point it was, I was down sixty percent on the position, so it's not it was not really a mistake I will say. But uh, if the fundamentals are here, you're down. You should not worry. But when you see there are no fundamentals, then it's a mistake. Accept it and move on. Let's talk about your copiers. Who should copy you and who shouldn't copy you? Ideally, of course, I would reply if everyone would copy me, but uh, this is not the right answer because I don't want people to copy me if uh, every day that the market is down, they are going to worry. It's not a good idea. And uh, because investors are different, this is uh, actually the video I recorded today. It was about the benchmarks. It's not that uh, you need to have uh, the benchmark is always going to be the S&P 500, 10% and your return over the long term. Maybe for you, you are a more, you have a lower risk tolerance and uh, you don't want to invest in 100% in stocks, you want to have some bonds, then your returns are of course going to be lower. But uh, then you should, it's not a problem if it's uh, the risk tolerance you have. So who should copy me? Only people who believe in long-term fundamental value investing. This is the ideal copy here. Of course, if someone is not a 100% value investor, they do some growth investing, maybe they want to diversify, they want to invest in a value investor, there is no issue with that. It depends on the company. But who should not copy, of course, those who are seeking returns which are unrealistic. Do you have many copiers who copy only you? Yes, I have a few copiers who copy only me. And how do you feel about that? Of course, uh, the responsibility, I understand 
that uh, it's uh, bigger relative to these couple of years. But uh, I'm not worried because most of my net worth is on eToro. Even now that uh, I'm making more money from eToro and uh, I don't, I cannot reinvest everything on eToro because it will affect the couple of years. So I'm investing with another broker, but uh, it's the same portfolio. I copy exactly the same portfolio. So it's in the same stocks. So I have skill in the game, I will say. So I'm not worried that someone copies me 100% of their portfolio because I have the same skin in the game. If uh, they lose money, I'm also losing money. Okay, so ideally, what role should you play as a PI in a copier portfolio? And can you describe that copier portfolio with you in it? Yes, so there is the value investing group on eToro. It's a... so run by Matty Allen, who is a consultant to eToro. So there is, for example, Callum. His uh, username is uh, Lord Fufu on eToro. He's also a value investor. There are many of them. So if someone wants exposure to only value investor, they can do this or they can choose one of them. But if now someone wants uh, a more diversified portfolio, maybe they can invest in growth investors, even in investors not investing in uh, stocks. It's, it depends on the copy here. Imagine you were a copier. How many PIs would you follow? How many PIs would you copy? If I were a copier, I would say maximum five. Because you don't want to be over diversified. If I were a copier and I still had that value investing mindset, maybe I would have looked for the top five value investors and invest in them. But now if I didn't have that value investing mindset, I would uh, maybe invest in one value investor, one growth investor, one uh, forex trader like this and to make it five maybe one in crypto and one in commodities what changes would you like to see on eToro it's uh, number one the news feed i think uh, you see too many distractions there is now a section just for popular investors maybe there can be some more work on that Well, this is a similar point to the one that Hugo made in the last episode. He wants to see more organization of the news feed so you can get rid of the clutter. Yes, yes, this is this is what I mean, to get rid of the clutter. You, yes, you can uh, follow people, but uh, then there are someone, you're following one ticker symbol and uh, someone else is just uh, writing something and uh, it's not really that uh, that uh, good for for what you're looking for maybe you're looking for good analysis but uh, that uh, ticker symbol have been used but not on analysis maybe a meme a joke and you don't want to see that but you will see it you, you want it or not so that's a uh, one work that uh, eToro can do to make the news feed based on the user what the user wants to see they are going to see it, like on twitter or on facebook but i know it's a lot of work i think it'll come Yes. And uh, another change, uh, it's about the volatility and risk. Uh, maybe Itoro should uh, consider that volatility is not always risk and try to change their risk score. Or rename it the volatility indicator. Yes, maybe. I doubt there are many other PIs in Mauritius, but what other PI would you say you know the best on a personal level? Well, I'm the only PI on Mauritius and actually only user on eToro because uh, eToro had uh, removed Mauritius from its uh, countries. So I'm the only user now. And uh, on a personal level, not really that close, but on Twitter, um, I have talked to some of them. For example, uh, Gasper Sopi, Jane Mises, of course, and uh, Hello is uh, Grief. All former guests on Copy Traders Club. That's good. <laughs> yeah, there are, there are other. For example, uh, he's not a copy. He's not a popular investor, but someone I talk often to is Matty Allen, who works for Itoro as a consultant. He's a value investor, and he's a sort of mentor to me. Very good. So he's a mentor to you as you strive to perfect the art of investing. Maybe now is a good time to assess whether you've perfected the art of cubing <laughs> shall we do the rubik's cube challenge yes we can okay before you start i suppose i have to set my stopwatch 
<laughs> okay, hold on. Don't start and don't. You can examine the cube as you wish, as they do in the official games. You can look at it for a few seconds, then place it down. Are you ready to begin? Yes, I place it down. In three, two, one, go. Solve. He's done 32 seconds and 40. <laughs> oh, well, I hope the listener enjoyed 32 seconds of clickety clackety noises there. <laughs> Brought to you by Coffee Traders Club. <laughs> For me, 32 seconds, that's only not a good performance. You're not happy? <laughs> well, you can work on it for your next appearance on the show. Yes. Well done. That's still incredible. Final question. If you were in my shoes... What question would you like to have asked yourself that I didn't? Maybe you could have asked me about uh, how uh, you asked me about my objectives on Ethereum. Maybe you could have asked about uh, maybe outside Ethereum or what I intend to do. Maybe it's that sort of question. That... So your plans for life? Yes. Uh, most, not really life, but as an investor, where I see myself, maybe, okay, what's where I see myself in 10 years? So, Ishfaq, as an investor, where do you see yourself in 10 years? It all depends first on how Ethereum is going to evolve because uh, I want to have a career as an investor, maybe to start my own fund, hedge fund. But I like staying on Ethereum because it gives the opportunity to someone with only $200 to invest, to have the same access to a fund manager. But uh, if uh, Itoro evolves that uh, you can go to, to big sums, to, to big uh, amount of asset under management, then maybe my career will be on Itoro. But after that, maybe I will, uh, I intend to start my own fund. So in 10 years where I see myself is with my own fund, right now I have about uh, 1.6 million in AUM. So let's say 50 million in 10 years. <laughs> It's a good dog, yeah. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see if eToro does become like a proving ground for investors. Yes. Who then go on to to bigger and better things. Yes, because the, the limitations on eToro is that uh, you can uh, copy, manage money for the people, but uh, you cannot really target these investments. It's just uh, they are copying you and the exact investments are being copied. But uh, if, let's say, I want uh, to invest in a company to as an activist investor, this is not something possible on it all. But if I had my own fund, maybe I, I could do it. I don't like the management. I can try to change the management. Sure, but for a guy who loves investing, who lives in Mauritius, it's an incredible platform for you today. Yes, of course. Yes, uh, I, I'm not saying that I don't like the platform. I love it. Or it's it's uh, it's uh, my best ever investment. Uh, I will say my best ever decision for that day that I joined Itoro. I would not have thought the day that I joined Itoro that all of this would have happened. It was just uh, a website I was trying to invest, and uh, like I said, I was living in Russia, and that was the me- best opportunity for me to invest on Itoro because in Russia. It, you cannot use a normal broker if you're not a resident. So I saw it to but uh, I would not have expected all of this to happen. And uh, I'm very happy today where I am. Well, that sounds like a great place to leave it. Ishvak, we're very happy to have spoken to you today. Thank you so much for joining us here. Yeah, thank you, Gavin, for receiving me, for making this a uh, great cause. Okay, all the best. Thank you, and all the best to you. Can you sign off using the same sign off that you have on your videos? I'd like to hear that live. Have a nice day and goodbye.
It was great to get to chat to Ishfaq after being aware of him for many months as one of the more colourful and lively characters on Etor. He's got an impressive brain and something of a unique perspective on things. It really is amazing to think of the reach of this platform and how it can transform lives in a way that was unimaginable just a few years ago. That's all from me. You can continue the conversation on Discord and Facebook. If you like this podcast and want to see it continue, you can do your part by recommending it to one person or group of people this week. Until next time we meet at Copy Traders Club, I wish you many happy returns. Obviously, anything you hear in this podcast is for entertainment only, not financial advice. Do your own research. This is just a chit chat. We don't know your individual circumstances, etc., etc., and so forth.